Hello, Morris. This one's just for you. And hello to the rest of you too. Yes, good. Uh, right, let's see. How many people have we got so far? Uh, none, according to Twitch. That's good. Um, right, we know we've got Morris in the chat, Danicron in the chat, uh, Standard Ints in the chat. Hello, Siggy's here as well. Bixie's here uh, at some point. Uh, uh, no doubt Magetsub and Co. will join us too. Oh, uh, Dr. Lokes, hello. Right. <clears throat> So everything's zoomed in because Morris wants to put me on the big screen. Uh, and I thought it would be even bigger. That would be some sort of joke there. Hello, Morris. Yes, Morris, there's a little an extra treat for you at the start of this stream. You'll have to watch the uh, the uh, video later on. Right, what are we going to talk about tonight? Well, lots of exciting things have happened. For some reason, my output window has become undocked and it's floating around. Oh, let's put that in the right place. So it'll drive me nuts. Um, not there. There. There we go. That's better. <coughs> Right. Ah, there he is. We get some altar as well. Good, good, good. Uh, so I have, I think, had a bit of a breakthrough. Uh, so let's just build up some context. So there's a, a, an introduction to what we're going to talk about tonight. Um, I'm building a 2D editor of things. This much is known by all of the audience so far. Uh, but we've handled tiles. We've done tiles. The other side of the editor I wanted to handle was geometry. Uh, and so that's specifically what I'm going to talk through tonight. Um, and as as I've been doing over the last few weeks, I've sort of abstracted away uh, the the whole editing environment to some sort of bodge together in Pixel Game Engine, uh, just so we can focus on these bits of interface and how the code all glues together. The 2D editor of pings. Yes, the gang's all here. That's what I like to see. <laughs> good 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 oh and uh, thank you standard int and morris for your uh, uh, little subscriptions there they happened before the start of the stream so it's good we don't get pestered by the noise i've got my headphones on this thing because i know i missed one last week which is uh, rather sad so let's uh firstly let's have a look why don't we have a look at the end result first um and that way try and entice people into seeing what's going on uh yes play let's go good Right, so we get a fairly bland grey screen. If I zoom in, it's actually a grid. Now, we've seen this in the editor. Grids are nothing new now. And we, yes, we can do all sorts of fancy rotations and all that. Don't need to show that off anymore. <coughs> but uh, what I wanted to have was some way of drawing shapes. Now, yes, right now I'm hijacking Pixel Game Engine to do this. It's just because I don't want to have the long compile times associated with what's becoming a, a quite a large project. Um, and it doesn't make the stream very interesting. So I've, I've just broken this bit out into isolation. And it's nice because I can sort of focus on it. So the idea is uh, you have a cursor that can snap to any of these grid points. There we go. We've, we've seen this before. Nothing new there. Uh, now, I've mapped to the... There is no user interface, so I have mapped certain keys to create certain shapes. Let's have a quick look at the chat. Uh, yeah, I don't need to be blasted during the video. Why about... Yes. <laughs> I was doing some web dev the other day, and I really didn't like it. Um, so, uh, let's carry on. So, if I press, for example, the R key... There we go. Uh, it's placed a vertex at the top of a rectangle. And as you can see, it follows the mouse around. And I can click somewhere to place the other vertex. And we've drawn a rectangle in the scene. Nice and easy. Um, and yes, it, it's generally Pixel Game Engine 3 doing the rendering. So this is all polygons, and it all looks nice and crispy. Uh, I'm running in debug mode at the moment. And it's Pixel Game Engine running via Pixel Game Engine 2, uh, which we discussed in some detail last week. So. <clears throat> R for rectangle, very good. If I press T, uh, it places the first vertex. Now I need to place the second vertex. And it creates T for, you ready for this? Triangle. Look at that. There we are. We've got a nice triangle shape there. Now, because things are automatically snapping to grids, this means you can actually create uh, sort of shapes that make sense. Right? You can get things to line up nicely, um, which is great for when you're building models. 
Okay, uh, let's try now C for, are you ready for this one? C for circle. Right? Press in the middle and we pull out to any point along the radius. Uh, you can see there's a, a colour change as well, so the vertices can be different colours. Now, it, it's snapping to the grid, which is quite nice if you want your circle to conform to sort of the rules of the grid. Um, if you go off grid slightly, you'll end up with, well, they snap to the grids at the angle, but it can be a little bit trickier to sort of get other things to line up to. So that's a snap to the grid circle. See, very nice. If I press... Uh, <coughs> uh, what do you do for a living? Um, I... Uh, head up a uh, research and development department for a robotics company uh, that builds robots for nuclear, aerospace, oil and gas, uh, basically places you don't want to send people. Johnny G, you're actually pretty much on time. Yeah, that's not too bad. Those Guinnesses have, have worn off then. That's good. Uh, so circle is there. Very good. Uh, now, if I press S... Uh, S is interesting. So this the first time we've placed the first sort of vertex. We place the second vertex, and now we can drag a segment. Look at that. See, isn't that nice? Right, so if we wanted sort of pizza sections, we can do pizza sections. And of course, you can then combine that uh, with some of the other shapes that you want to draw to start modeling uh, more interesting things. You can get it all to line up. Nice. <coughs> Let's say, now I've forgotten what the other keys are, D. So D is another interesting one because it's a multi-point one. So we press, we press the first uh, vertex, uh, then we can click on the second one, and then we can go on to the third one and stretch it out. Then we can do sections. I don't really know what the geometric term is for this. Uh, yeah, I guess a, a, a sector is not too bad. Of a section sector. I'm sure the maths nerds will, will pull me up on that one. Um, wait, circle rendering. <coughs> Everything's possible, Morris. Everything's possible. Right. Uh, so let's uh, let's try and be. I've probably got this all lined up wrong now. So if you click, uh, I try now. These are these are handed, so this might not work. But we'll see what happens if I select the and the. Yeah, you see, at the moment it's handed. I probably need a key code to sort of flip something uh, to make it line up. But we can start to construct interesting shapes is, is kind of the point I'm trying to make. Now, there are some more. Uh, if I press the 1 key... Now, everything you've seen so far has used something called a construction technique. Uh, and, and we'll go through what that is uh, later. But these ones don't use construction techniques. Uh, so when I click on vertices, they're genuine vertices. But these are the, the sort of lowest level primitives. The first one, if I press 1, uh, this is the entry point or center point of a fan style polygon. Okay? And I have to press the right mouse button to sort of finish the shape building. Uh, if I press 2, that's the first vertex of what's called a strip type polygon. And these are things that we've actually discussed over the, the last few weeks. Let's go up here. It's nice, you see, you can navigate around the thing whilst you're still editing. You can zoom in and out. We can rotate and do all sorts of nice things. So we keep that going. Uh, what am I doing? I want to go over this way, then this way. And we'll click you, and then we'll finish off with a right click just to close the shape. You don't have to close the shape, but it's interesting that you can. Now, you see the FPS dropping. The FPS dropping isn't dropping because of the uh, the, the shapes. It's dropping because of the many lines it needs to draw. <laughs> uh, I don't have sort of a clamp on that at the moment. <coughs> now, uh, what is the last one, last shape that I've implemented? This is the nice one. And if you've been on the Discord recently, you'll have seen this one. So I can press uh, the 4 key, and that places a center point. And then I press another one, and we get what looks like a polygon. And I can drag it out, and it becomes a star. Isn't that nice? Can be a star, and it's a star that you can sort of point uh, in the direction you want to have as well. And of course, that's all snap to grid, so you can get things to line up quite nicely too. So this is is all done uh, using a single interface, and that's what we'll discuss in the video. Uh, and it's become very quick and simple to add construction techniques to this. Uh, 
Other than mapping it to the key code, the construction technique is actually externalized into a Lua script. So it's Lua that's generating all of this geometry um, and then the sort of rendering system uh, displaying it. Uh, there's no sort of any any other editing features yet. That's as far as I've got, and that's I think is a is a critical milestone for this project uh, because I've, I've got a feeling that the the interface for Lua has become very very elegant indeed. Uh, and of course, I'm I'm using the full power of Sol three here, and we'll we'll, we'll talk about that as well uh, tonight. So there's no way of selecting the shapes or editing them after the fact. Um, that's the next phase, uh, and I think that's all fairly fairly doable too. Let me have a quick catch up with the chat. <coughs> Uh, just cut a circle. Okay, we're just talking about circles. We need a YouTube video for Lua. Yes, in fact, that's a good shout, actually, Johnny G. Um, I've got a couple of Lua ones already, but I've not got a Sol specific one, and I, I think that's going to be my next video. Uh, in fact, it was that that drove this little bit of the project. I was thinking, I could do with a video idea. I've got a few already, that, but they're not quite finished. Um, but it would be nice to perhaps draw a line under the Lua series of videos um, by saying, right, well, we've looked at how you do it by hand, but here's how you can do it for real, and the, you get a lot of benefits, and there's a lot more power um, using the Sol library. So I think that's going to be a very worthwhile YouTube video to make. All right, Morris is making his own bread, uh, everybody. Um, good for Morris. I think it'll be one of those things that you'll be really into for the next two months. And then it'll just sort of go by the wayside. And then you've just got more kitchen junk. Uh, right, let's have a look at some code. There's the shapes. All very good. Uh, just hang on. I've got a ping on the Discord server. What's going on? <coughs> uh, right, so some guy asking for firewall advice. Uh, now's not the time. I'll, I shall let him know. Now's not the time. I'm live streaming right now. We'll be back later. There we go. <laughs> right. So, oh, hang on. I'm getting red lines on the bit rate according to Twitch. I don't know why that's the case. There's nothing actually dropping. I stream at about 6,000 kilobits per second. I'm guessing Twitch sees that as uh, as inferior. Um, and so maybe it's changed the thresholds for what's considered stable and unstable. The rate is pretty solid. <laughs> So, right, this code, right, let's get stuck in. Uh, so you'll see at the top here, this is now just a simple uh, single file solution again. It's actually not very long, as you can see, and we'll, we'll have a look at the bits of it. Um, we've In the past, we've been looking at the PG3 files, and we, remember we were talking about strokes and polygons and shading and all that sort of thing. Um, I'm going to assume by now that if you see on the screen draw line, you understand what it does, so we don't need to talk about it anymore. Uh, and in the previous uh, episode, we looked at polymorphs, um, where we were looking at creating a polygon structure, uh, which is this here. Um, for the time being, polymorphs has just been put on the shelf, because actually what we're going to look at is how do we construct these polygons in a more user-friendly manner. Uh, and so that's what we're looking at in this test program today. You'll see that the vertex type hasn't changed. It consists of a position and a color. Uh, I've got a structure called a polygon, <coughs> which is just a vector of vertices, and something that describes to how the vertices are glued together to form shapes um, or, or polygons, because uh, I actually have a specific shape class. Now, <coughs> you're going to hear me sort of intermittently say shape and construction and scaffolding and everything. So I'm just going to momentarily blind you all. There we go. And uh, going to talk about what do I mean by a construction. <coughs> when the user is creating a shape, let's say a circle, for example. Let me draw a circle. There we go. We're all happy that's a circle. Um, when we construct the circles, as the discussion has just been happening, um, the actual circle is constructed as a fan. So we've got a singular, I might not need to use some different colors here. We've got a singular vertex in the middle, and we go to the outside, and we actually go all the way around our circle. Yes, I'm, you see in the videos, I get to sort of speed all this sort of stuff up uh, and cut the bits out, but for the live streams, you've just got to enjoy it. Enjoy the sort of 
the happy little accidents. There we are. Lots of people say uh, happy little accidents around my channel. Right, and we join these up as a fan, which means we always go from the middle to the outside like this. Dum -de -dum -de -dum. It's nice. Yeah, I like this. It's like ASMR stuff. I'm like, oh, I'm getting a bit wonky now. See, again, I would normally get the opportunity to sort of edit these and, and make them all look very pretty. But you're getting the idea. We're drawing a fan. There we go. And we've lost our centre vertex. Now, as you've just witnessed, that took me quite some time. And if I'm trying to draw the triangles individually, <coughs> um, I've got a lot of vertices to place. And I've got to place them in the right place, uh, which is quite tricky to do as a mere human being. What would have been a far better thing to do is to define this shape as being um, the result of some additional set of points um, known as part of a construction. And of course when you're defining a circle, one way to define a circle is you define the midpoint and then you define a point on the circumference and those two construction points uh, provide you enough information uh, to actually draw, uh, to, to automatically fill in all of these red vertices. Uh, and that's the bit that we're offloading to Lua. Another way to define a circle potentially could be to actually look at the rectangle that it's bounded in. So you have a point up here and you have a width and a height and again you've got enough information to then start drawing the whole shape. There are some other bits of meta information which I've not included tonight. Uh, they are kind of hard-coded numbers but as we've seen in uh, previous editor videos uh, that we can actually sort of have additional information. For example, how many vertices do you want to go around the edge? What colours should they be by default? Um, if, and, and later on you'll see uh, things like stars and stuff are basically the same algorithm uh, but with fewer points and some of them are displaced slightly. So when I'm talking about construction, uh, what I'm saying is the user will, the algorithm will present the user with specific sets of nodes uh, used to construct all of this additional ge geometry. Uh, so don't get confused between a C++ constructor and, in this case, it is a shape construction. Um, <laughs> Pyrotux, no, not too late. <coughs> oh, uh, yeah, atom fighter. Clockwise, is, that's an interesting thing to describe. Uh, so uh, there is something called winding order which does apply to these shapes. It doesn't strictly apply to my rendering engine right now, but it should. Uh, so we will worry about winding order at some point in the future. But right now, really what I'm trying to demonstrate is think of construction as being this nice friendly user interface and uh, sort of it generates vertices. It generates the polygon. If we consider a, a simpler shape, for example, a rectangle, make sure I can see these dots, we've got our first user point here and the user may drag the mouse or whatever over to here to give us a height and a width then the algorithm is smart enough to go and generate four vertices at those locations, very simple to do, uh, and it will pick a particular polygon structure, again in this case it's a fan, uh, which can then go and link all of this together to form some nice rectangle structure. Uh, segments and things like that are exactly the same as circle, but with the addition of more control points, like this, uh, I called them nodes, construction nodes, uh, then of course it can go and generate the rest of the vertices necessary. So when you saw sort of the filled in um, donut sort of sector shape, we didn't quite need to give it a shape, uh, it was of course just that sort of area then filled in. Yeah. I've got to be careful, this could end up looking quite rude, this picture. But, uh, <laughs> thinking of that, uh, we'll move on. <coughs> Why is it usually clockwise for the order? It's a good question. Uh, I think it's specifically related to the standard accepted cross product of two vertices yielding a value uh, on the outside or the inside of a knuckle. Um, so if you've got uh, specifically three vertices, uh, let's say like this, one here, one here, and one here, um, when you take the cross product of these two in two-dimensional space or three-dimensional space, either you'll have a point sticking out this way or you'll have a point sticking out that way. And as long as you're consistent, then you know that you're always on the inside or the outside of your polygon shape. And, and you can deal with it as such. So that's why we have winding orders. Um, just so the algorithm knows, well, am I, do I fill in this side or do I fill in this side? It, it, it doesn't know. Uh, it doesn't know what's the inside or the outside of a polygon. 
so let's close that down. <laughs> it's a Dune work. Of course it's a Dune work. God, that's a rubbish film, isn't it? I watched Dune 1 um, uh, again last weekend. Because I watched the first time I watched it, I, I fell asleep. And the second time I thought, oh, I'll give it a go because Dune 2 is out and I've got some friends that are talking about it. And it's just rubbish. It's very pretty, very pretty rubbish, but it's just, yeah, it's, it's naff. Um, right. So I have this uh, sort of catch-all object called a shape. Now, originally I was going to sort of always keep polygons separate. Uh, but I decided that you're really always going to construct the polygon, except for the case where you're manually constructing fans and strips and lists. Um, if it, You're always going to really use a construction object with a shape. So I decided to actually have just shape and embed polygon into the shape. Now, every shape that's created is going to have its own Lua state machine. And some of you may think, oh, no, I'm going to have thousands of shapes. No, you're not. Right? It's, that's, that's actually a very rare occurrence. Um, when you're creating the shapes, you can have an active Lua state machine. When the shape just exists, it's just polygon data. So the state machine can be shut down quite happily. But <coughs> it does actually allow for some interesting interactions between Lua and C++, and we'll have a look at those too. It's quite boring. Yeah, I've I've not seen the second one yet. Uh, I I just felt uh, I don't I just it it was it wasn't for me. It's trying to be I have a feeling it was trying to be a bit Lord of the Rings in space. You know, it's deliberately sort of immediately quite complicated, but actually it's not very complicated. It's just not very deep. Um, yeah. Anyway, yeah, I can, I can understand that full on cancellation is coming my way right now. <laughs> <coughs> uh, right. So, uh, yes, as well as my shape, I've also got a vector of just 2D coordinates called nodes. They're the construction nodes that we've been looking at. Uh, and I have some properties uh, just to keep track of what's going on during the construction of the shape. <coughs> Excuse me. So the only real information that I'm actually storing here, if I was to serialize this, are uh, really just the, these sort of four things. Well, actually, these three things. I don't need to serialize that. It's the script that generated the shape. So if I wanted to regenerate it in the future, I need to know, well, am I a triangle? Am I a circle? Am I a square? That's going to be defined by the script. Uh, the polygon data I can read in uh, sort of straight away. And, and this is also important because what I don't want to happen is you change the nodes of the shape and it goes away and completely uh, regenerates the polygon. I don't want to lose things like color information and perhaps other subtleties like deviation from the original shape. So there's some games to play there yet. But right now, uh, every time we form a change in the nodes, we are going to completely regenerate the shape. Well, let's have a look at why and how I'm going about doing this. Uh, so the, the object, when it's created, uh, you, you supply a script uh, file to it, uh, and then you call this initialize function. And the initialize function doesn't necessarily do anything other than load the script file. So here we can see it's creating the state machine using Sol. Uh, it opens the libraries. I figured actually the libraries that people might actually need for generating shapes are maths and base. Uh, table, uh, maybe. Maybe. If you, we, I think I just copy and pasted this line from what we were doing for generating tiles. I then add to it some uh, some convenient features. So if you didn't know, uh, with Sol, it allows you to add sort of custom types into the Lua sort of user space. Now, that's traditionally a pretty tricky thing to do, but Sol does actually make this quite easy. So I'm adding in the VF2D, the uh, two-dimensional vector type, uh, floating point vector type. Uh, and to do this, you pass in what constructors that shape might have, and then you map the properties. So these are the properties X and Y that I care about. I don't get access to all of the functions and things. You literally just have X and Y. And I can map it onto basically a, a getter and a setter. So when I when I, when Lua reads from the variable, where does it get it from? And when it writes to the variable, what's it writing to? In this case, it's the same thing. So that's why they're, they're all mapped the same. So I added then uh, a second one, pixel, uh, because we know that our particular polygon vertices consists of position and color. So I thought that, that'll be quite convenient. And we'll see why what effect this has to the Lua code in a moment. And I guarantee once you've sort of seen the elegance of all this, you're all going to start doing things in Lua uh, with, with the Sol library. Uh, 
I thought, why stop there? We've got these components of the, the vector. How good is Sol? Will it allow me to actually have my vertex type? So if we have a look at the vertex, it is a structure which is a combination of the two. Well, of course, it's got no problem with that at all. <coughs> so we have my vertex. It can be constructed in Lua with a position and a color. And here are the, the properties, pos and col, and same format as before. We just point to them. And I thought, well, hang on. Why don't I just have the whole polygon stored in the Lua state machine? So you'll see here, uh, I have got my polygon type, <coughs> uh, which is useful. It's, it's this thing here uh, with this information. But uh, in, instead of having one inherit the other, they're, they're sort of side by side because what I want to do is map my polygon here in Lua space directly to the vertices, uh, the vector of vertices in my C++ space. And this is where the power really starts to come in. So when we start altering the polygon in Lua, we're actually altering the vector uh, in, in our C++ land. I'll show you how that works because that's actually really interesting stuff. So we can see I can set that vector, I have access to it, I can read and write the properties, and I can read and write the type, which is just, basically just a number. I then go away and create two variables inside my Lua state machine. So in Sulfur, you can easily create a new variable. Uh, you just simply include it. And I'm pointing to the poly, which is this polygon type. So in Lua, when you see polygon out, that's the generated geometry, it's directly manipulating the C++ type. Uh, he's probably doing that by all sorts of interesting shenanigans behind the scenes to handle all of the communication between the two spaces. But from a user perspective, it's elegant. I don't need this to be fast. You don't generate polygons in real time every frame. They happen once, and then once it's done, you, you, you just use the data. Uh, I also have created a, a variable called node, which links to my vector of construction nodes. And so that's really the input to the construction algorithm, and this is the output to the construction algorithm. So we just supply nodes, and we generate all of the vertex data. And we'll have a look at a very simple script. <coughs> Let's look at rectangle.lua. Zoom out a bit so we can see some of that. Hopefully you're all still, uh, you've not all like fallen asleep yet. I hope not, anyway. Um, code zone, code zone chat. Okay, no, nothing's coming up there. Oh, it says chat pause due to scroll. Okay, not yet. Good. I, yes, I, I have no idea. The Twitch interface changes every every week. <coughs> so this is it, right? This is everything to create that rectangle. Let's just go and familiarize ourselves with what we did to create the rectangle. Um, so run, run the application. It shouldn't need. To, I, I must have. I must have selected something in in the code, and that's why it's recompiling. It shouldn't need to. Let's just zoom in, and if I press the R key, I've loaded my rectangle script, and now I've got these two nodes, and every time I change those nodes, I call the regenerate polygon data. Uh, in fact, I can show you how nice and live this is. So there's the first shape. I've clicked it and finished it off. I'm going to not close down the application, but I'm just going to change the script, and I'll pick a, pick a number. I'll change this to zero here and save just the script. Uh, I've not relaunched the application, um, but if I press now the R key again, you can see it changed the color of that particular vertex. Right? So that the script is, is is sort of live editable uh, in that regard. That makes it quite easy to actually debug the script. Right now, my little test process doesn't have any sort of error catching facility at all, so it's very easy to crash things if you don't quite get it right. <coughs> but it, it shows that actually it is the script that is doing the thing. Uh, and we can also play, why, why not just change the color? Let's go and change uh, some positions. So let's say that this uh, bottom right dot y always has plus five to it um, for, for no apparent reason other than for this demonstration. So if I come and choose another rectangle, rectangle, so you can see, uh, we actually start to change the shape of the geometry. So let's close that down and actually study what's going on uh, in this file. Let's undo those two changes. Uh, speaking of triangulating a circle, fell fast away. <coughs> okay, you may have to uh, drop the links uh, somewhere on the Discord. Twitch is a bit fussy about which links it allows through. So let's have a look. 
so this construct polygon, uh, it's, it, this is the function that's always called, uh, and all the uh, Lua space needs to do is provide the host with how many construction nodes are required for this shape, and what's the minimum number of construction nodes required before you can start to draw something. So with a rectangle, uh, once I've placed the first construction node, uh, the second construction node is sort of automatically assumed at that point uh, because it's underneath the mouse. I can always start drawing. I can draw a rectangle quite happily with that information. There'll never be more than two construction nodes. So in this case, uh, the Lua script, once it starts to run, which is here, you can see we're, we're, we've loaded the script. I can go and get get max construction. So this is why Sol is just brilliant, right? There's no faffing about with tables and, and conversions. Uh, go and look for something called that in the script. If it exists, brilliant, return its value. If it doesn't, uh, just return zero. <coughs> we'll come back to what happens if this is minus one in a minute, because that's a special case. Uh, but other than that, go away and create our vector of construction nodes and just default them to zero, zero. If there's some errors, we can output them to the console. I'm not really trying to catch them and, and deal with them properly at the moment. <coughs> uh, sorry about my, my cough tonight. It's not very good. Uh, so that's it. That's all the initialize function does. Let's go back to our construction. So uh, many times throughout the, uh, the algorithm's lifetime, whilst, whilst we're creating the shape, we're going to be calling this construct polygon every time we change the position of a node. Well, I just assume we're always going to create new geometry. That's not always going to be the case, but right now, that's what I'm assuming. So I specify the type. That's just a number. That's a fan. What, what's that mapping onto? Well, if we go up to our polygon type here, uh, it picks from this, uh, this enumeration uh, various uh, constants. Uh, for the different types of polygon construction. And we these fan, line, list, and strip. And we've discussed those previously. So that's setting up what is the sort of mechanical construction of the polygon. And then check this out. This is where it becomes really, really powerful. Recall polygon out is actually a, a, basically uh, our reference to a polygon. It has a property called verts. And if we go over to our polygon type, verts, is a standard vector of vertices or vertex up here. Uh, Sol has automatically thrown into the Lua environment some accesses for that standard container. So this vert is actually the C++ vector and clear will clear the C++ vector. How nice is that? I think that's a very powerful tool. Um, so now we can think about actually working directly in the C++ memory space using Lua to execute those commands. Now, your mic noise suppression was making me think I'm lagging. Is it not quite in sync with my... Uh, it changes. Uh, I, I try to change the value a fair bit. Yeah, I can see on my screen it's lagging, but I never actually know if it's actually lagging or not. Um, anyway, if that's your only problem with the stream, that's fair enough. Uh, so, uh, so yes, we, we can actually manipulate the, 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 st the standard vector directly from the Lua stuff. So we're not creating Lua memory and transferring things across boundary. We're telling Lua, actually, just, just go and use the stuff that's already there in C++. That's why we don't need to have lots of linkages between the script and what's going on, because we've injected these types into the Lua state machine space. It understands how to use them. It just happens to know um, things like the, the, uh, the mapping here. If, if you allocate a standard vector, uh, it knows how to handle that mapping. <coughs> uh, well, the IntelliSense doesn't pick up the clear. Um, it, Lua uh, has some protocols about how its uh, language is constructed, um, and uh, Visual Studio is quite happy to syntax highlight Lua appropriately. <coughs> Uh, so, there's clear. Right. We've got a little check just to make sure that we're not attempting to do things we shouldn't. If we've not got enough construction nodes already placed, then we obviously can't generate the geometry. So there's just a, a little bit of a safety thing there. Uh, if that's the case, return nothing. So we've cleared our standard vector. Uh, I then go and make uh, some checks to work out what's the top left and bottom right of my uh, rectangle. That's important. Let's see why that's important. It needs to build it again for some reason. <coughs> Uh, why is this important? Because uh, as a human being, I'm prone to making mistakes. So if I want my rectangle to go that way, 
Um, they still want top left to be top left and this to be bottom right. But up this way, I want this to be top left and the fixed position to be bottom right. So it, I don't want to create rectangles with negative widths and height. I need to go away and sort those out. So I, I do a quick little check here <coughs> using the, the Lua Maths libraries to do these routines. So these are all built into Lua already. But there's something interesting. Look at this. We're creating our 2D vector. And we've got a, a, our type that we've injected into the Lua space. And we can call this new function. So again, this is something that Sol... The Sol3 library is added into the space here, um, allows us to construct, because remember we told it what a constructor is for VF2D, there it is, we can construct one with two floating point values as the parameters, and there we go, we've got our two floating point values as the parameters. I think it's really, it's really clever this, it is properly clever stuff. And so that's now created in Lua space a new vector uh, floating point 2D type uh, which we're going to use. And you can see then the pattern starts to uh, to be repeated here. This is our polygon out, this was our uh, uh, with a its vertex um, vector of vertices. We don't have push back and in place back and things but instead we have add. Now the, the Sol documentation is a little complicated, it's not that clear, um, but there are a whole bunch of routines. They, they, they have similar names to what you expect them to be. And I get why they're not a one-for-one -one comparison, because a lot of those things just don't make sense in Lua space. For example, does anybody see the presence of a node zero? Hmm. Anyway, add will add something to this um, vector and in this case I want to add a new whole vertex. Now remember we've got a vertex type injected in, we've created the constructor new, let's go and have a look at it. Uh, here we go, our vertex and if we look at one of the constructors we've provided alongside the default is it takes in a VF2D type and a pixel type. Let's go and have a look, VF2D creating a new one of those and pixel creating a new one of those with our RGB and alpha patterns. Uh, can make C++ with Lua work in the inscription? Yes, of course you can. Uh, in, uh, Lua is entirely embeddable in your C++ program and has no graphical requirements or input handling requirements at all. So yes, it should be not a problem to make Lua work with inscription. <coughs> uh, it should just work, yeah. Yeah, maybe Bixie. I think you'd need a little bit of uh, JavaScript to help you do that in terms of... Oh, no, because you, you can just run strings in Lua. That's right. You, you don't necessarily have to create a file. Creating files in Inscripton is a little bit fiddly for obvious reasons. Um, but you can just run the string. So yes, you should be able to create some sort of self-editing uh, editor quite easily. So there we go. Uh, that's it. That is everything for constructing a rectangle. And look how cut down that was. Those of you that might recall the setup required for uh, doing tiles, we had multiple transactions when we were drawing tiles between Lua space and C++ space. I'm going to revisit those and take this approach where we've got a far more tightly coupled memory space uh, basically overlapping the two. It does, yeah, it does have that virtual file system. Uh, there are some limitations on, on what you can do with that. Um, yeah, it's not persistent, of course. For, again, for, for obviously, hang on, somebody's pinged me. Uh, what's this? Pixel Game Engine. Oh, it was Pyrotox. Oh, yeah, oh, thank you for that. Yeah, I'll have, I'll have a look at that later. Speedy. Yeah, you, you are late. You are not Speedy C. You are Slowly C today. Uh, right, so... Taking this sort of format, let's have a look at uh, an even simpler one. The reason I've started with this one is because it's a bit more interesting. But the most dull one is basically a uh, generic fan. There we go. <coughs> so generic fan. Let's run generic fan. Generic fan, I think, was this one. Uh, where we place the first node of the polygon structure and then we can sort of click around like so. Until we create a fan shape. And you can go both ways. So it's so sort of the fan shape. Lua with inscription for the next jam. Oh, these, these things come around quick, don't they? <coughs> oh dear, Coda 2K raiding with a rather large party. Um, I shall leave my crab claws on there then. Maybe everybody thinks I'm doing rust. Hello, <laughs> Coda 2K. Thank you very much. <coughs> Ugh. 
Hello from Berlin. We're talking about uh, using the Sol uh, library, specifically Sol 3, to embed Lua into C++ in a really intuitive way. Uh, and I'm, I've totally fallen in love with it. <laughs> Hello, everybody. <coughs> You're all very welcome to our, our humble little code zone on a, on a Tuesday afternoon. It is Tuesday today. It is Tuesday. Uh, so, yes. Uh, we can create, so that was the, the fan shape. So let's have a very look, uh, quick look at why why this works. Again, you can see um, we've specified something about our construction nodes, how many are we going to have, uh, and we have this repeatedly called construct polygon function. Again, it sets the type, again it clears, again it does some sort of check, and then we have a bit of Lua magic. Uh, so here we've got our node. Now recall that node is actually a C++ standard vector of um, uh, coordinates. Uh, the, the hash symbol in front of node will uh, tell you the size of the vector, basically. So for every construction node, uh, simply place a vertex at that location. Uh, and that's why, <coughs> excuse me, that's one of the most sort of simple primitives there. Now, why do we have a, uh, uh, go back to my generic fan, why do we have uh, our construction node set to minus one in this instance as not bounded. And that's because we need basically as many uh, vertices or nodes as is required. There's no sort of, like a circle, there's only going to be two nodes. In this instance, we're going to have um, a sort of a node per vertex. So I, I keep that as a special case. Basically, rather than predefining the size of my nodes vector, um, I, I say it's right. The nodes vector is the thing that's going to grow, so just keep that as a one-to-one -one copy with Lua space. <laughs> Thank you all very much for all the, the hellos there. <coughs> uh, so yes, this is part of a... Uh, <laughs> I've been coughing for a long time, yes I know. Um, this is part of a, a larger project, which is uh, I'm building a, basically a, a 2D editor of all sorts of things. I'm, I'm not going to show that tonight, um, but it, it's been, been part of the series so far. Uh, it, it does things like tile editing, vector editing. We're hoping it's going to have animation editing. It's lots of 2D stuff. Any of, any of you that uh, happen to have seen my, my YouTube channel um, will be aware that I fundamentally deal mostly in, in two-dimensional concepts and, and games. And I thought it'd be quite an interesting challenge to have an editor that I can call my own, but it's also very intuitive to use, but aimed at coders specifically. So the outputs from this editor, as well as being images, are actually very customizable things um, that other programmers can easily absorb into their tool flow. It doesn't have to be C++, but the, the data is at, le at least accessible and scriptable. <laughs> oh, got some. Uh, we've got some German there. <laughs> I think. <laughs> <coughs> yes, I've been. Uh, I've been coughing for quite some time. Um, it's the same. Same problem. I've never been the same since I had my uh, gallbladder removed. Uh, right. Update polygon. So that's what we're going to have a look at now. You can see there's really nothing to this. Uh, we're going to every time we change a node position, we're going to call this update polygon uh, member of the shape. Uh, and this calls the equivalent Lua function. It provides the current construction node, and that's because I don't want to output geometry if I've not got enough construction nodes, and that's what that check was for. Uh, so you know, don't start trying to draw a rectangle if you've only placed one node, it's no good. Uh, so as you can see with some of these shapes, so if I wanted to draw uh, the star shape, for example, um, it can't draw anything with just one node. I need to place another node before it can start to actually draw uh, anything at all. And so that's just it's just a, a sort of a usability check because I, I wouldn't know what to draw um, without that second node at that point. So it needs a minimum of three before it can start doing anything useful with that information. Whereas the rectangle just has the two. Right? Uh, the I, I call this the donut section. So let's have a look. Uh, so D requires a middle point. Uh, some other point and then a third point. So you can see I can put this one anyway, it's not drawing anything yet, but it needs that third point to specify what the the width of the, the shape really is. Uh, in this instance. There we go. <coughs> and if I can find that midpoint again, is it about there or is it that one? I think it's that one. Let's see if we get this right. If I press C for circle, I only need the two things. For, oh, I was out. I was out by one cell. Oh, never mind. <coughs> Never mind. Uh, 
Uh, nothing serious. No, I, I have. I've, you know, I will put people's minds at rest. I have been absolutely thoroughly checked out by doctors and hospitals. I've had X-rays, ultrasounds, uh, and everything. What the problem actually is? People that want the gory details and all of these new friends I've got that, that want to, to know these things um, is typically when I'm streaming. I've just eaten about an hour ago, <laughs> and it's uh, sitting down. Um, has uh, sort of squashes all my stub juices and it's just it's an acid reflux based cough so there you go you know the grisly details now um, <laughs> I have my my bottle of Gaviscon on hand to help out uh, right so that's it that's the Lua space sort of thing and some of the algorithms do get more complicated so if we have a look at the star rendering one we've just seen there I don't know why Lua why don't you have a hypotenuse function just built into your math library I have no idea uh, we can see we need um, there's only a maximum of three construction nodes we need a minimum of two to start drawing the shape and you can see the construction of the shape is actually a little bit more complicated <laughs> Um, so in this case, I need to work out the two radii for the, the, the star. But because you want the star to also be tiltable, uh, you need to know what the starting, excuse me, the starting angle is. Now it all makes sense, right? All the, the coughs and things. Uh, I'll get whatever the starting angle is. Um, and because it's a fan shape, fundamentally, I'm placing the center point of the star here. Uh, and then I'm iterating round. The, I've, I've just sort of staggered it out here just to keep the code a bit clearer. Um, without trying to sort of duplicate calculations. Lua is not very smart when it comes to reusing things it's previously calculated. It can do it, um, but typically it doesn't. So it will just do everything that you tell it to do. Um, so it's always good to try and sort of, yeah, have a go at doing a bit of optimization yourself. Uh, so that's why the star algorithm is a bit more complicated. <coughs> Drink of milk. Yeah, I don't know. Milk's not, not typically for me. Uh, not a big milk drinker. So, uh, let's have a look at the rest of the program. Update polygon, there we go. So this is the actual polygon as the test program. Uh, it, it's, it contains code that we've been looking at over the last few weeks, um, where we've looked at sort of bootstrapping Pixel Game Engine 3 into Pixel Game Engine 2. There's nothing in on user create, Pixel Game Engine 3 stuff. Um, <coughs> I've created a couple of Lambda functions which are in response to all of this here. So here we go, we can start to see where we're creating the new shape. If I'm not constructing a shape already and I press the R key, uh, then please use this script file to create a new shape. And this is where the powers really come in. There's no knowledge in, in my C++ land of what is the shape. I have no object that says I'm a circle and I must be treated differently. It exists purely as the shape. And if we go back to our shape class definition, uh, we can see we store the name of the script and we store the state machine currently for that one shape. Go back to a point I made earlier, that might seem a bit overkill. Why are we always using like new Lua state machines? Well, they don't actually have a huge memory footprint in reality. And other than editing the shapes, actually using the shapes, you don't need the state machine at all. So when we export this information from the editor, it doesn't come with a state machine attached to it. It just gives you the damn information that you care about. So I have a bunch of uh, shapes mapped to keys. These are the keys I was pressing before, K1, K2, K3, and all the shapes that we demonstrated. Uh, and so when we create a new shape, that does the initialization, that loads the Lua script and, and configures it all and gets it ready. And then we always want to place a node when we create the shape. That's what gives us this nice sort of intuitive usability. So I can go to a specific location, press the key, and then just immediately start drawing the shape. If you ever use sort of CAD packages, that's quite a common way to do things. <coughs> There's one shape I didn't actually demonstrate, which was list. Can I demonstrate this one? Um, so this one uh, looks like it's just generating lots of triangles, but all of these triangles are actually one object. They're just broken up. So that's a, a common uh, polygon structural type as well. So if you wanted to create sort of, I, I, I really don't know, but sort of weird objects, uh, or, or you wanted to do some tricks. If you wanted to hand craft uh, a circle but have all of the triangles individual colors, for example, this is the kind of object you would use for it uh, because you could create one blade of your fan there and then you could just go and do it again and again and again. So you actually get sort of discrete polygons. It's like the same trick when you're defining a cube. Um, 
this is my, my rubbish looking cube here. Uh, if it, One thing noobs always find, sorry noobs, shouldn't use derogatory terms like that, uh, when you're creating your first cube in 3D and you find actually you don't have all of the faces um, to be uh, different colours, they just seem to all blend into one. And that's typically because you don't realise you actually need to duplicate um, those faces and those edges to keep them unique because you've got a, a bleed of information otherwise. So that, that's a, a particular type. So you can see all the vertices are still highlighted uh, for that specific type until I right click. So all of that is now one object, excluding the circle of course. <coughs> I need a standing desk. I stand up all day. <laughs> the last thing I need is a standing desk. <laughs> um, right, so that's where we're constructing the shapes uh, and there's not really much else going on in the program uh, the only thing that's uh, interesting i suppose we've looked we've looked at creating the infinite grid so the infinite grid is this sort of uh, this this grayness because for some reason i need to zoom in um, but it's quite an interesting thing because it's also sensitive to rotation so it, it's it's an infinite grid it's optimized to sort of only drawing around the visible area of the screen which is quite nice um, yeah, so we've drawn the grid. Fine, fair enough. Uh, and then all I'm doing is what we saw uh, last week where I'm iterating through all of the shapes that I have in my vector. I'm decomposing them because they're in PGE3 format, uh, and then I'm drawing them using PGE2. Uh, there we go, that's the PGE3 draw routine. Uh, what was I going to show? There's one... Uh, what's the important bit? There's an important bit. Ah, yeah. If I've got my constructing flag constructing shape flag set to true uh, then at the moment and this is a bit of a hack and, and we'll change this because now what we want to do is be able to edit change between sort of object editing mode and vertex editing mode um, if I'm I'm just currently saying whatever is the last shape you, you've drawn that's obviously the one you're currently editing set the node at the very back to the current position of the cursor and update the polygon and that's giving us this sort of live uh, feedback and so that's a very simple program. So actually, it's a really simple program because there's, you know, it's doing a lot of things uh, in very little code. Let me zoom out. Um, you know, most of this code is about loading the correct file. Um, the, the the drawing of the stuff uh, is now okay. There's a bit there to draw the grid and then to draw the shapes. And. Uh, these are the, there's just these two functions, which one is it initializes a new shape, and the other is to, to push it into the vector to begin with, um, and that's it, really. So I think it's quite a powerful tool. So where is all of that clever? Well, all of that clever is now completely in the realms of the Lua scripts. Have a look at the segment script here. And the Lua scripts are no longer really horribly verbose. If I uh, pop open another Visual Studio, uh, where's that gone? That's gone up here actually open the editor project let's bring this in for a second um, yes so this is the uh, I don't know why this is split the window up there that's dreadful isn't that awful can I just pick that up how do I how do I get this out of the way why is it done that well whatever um, when we look at the scripts that we were creating for this <coughs> So the rectangle script. See, the first one, we look at this, right? This is for drawing a rectangle. There's all sorts of things going on. It's, it's just not right. Um, and that's mainly because of my ignorance of how to use Sol 3 properly, but also not really thinking about having shared memory spaces between the two. It was a bit, a bit naive on my half. When we look at the things like the, the tile painting stuff, um, placing tiles, I feel there's probably a lot of the same tricks we can copy. Now, one of the things I did like about this approach was this win, uh, this sort of table we create at the top of the Lua script uh, where we can construct a, a custom control interface. So things like the star, you might want to define how many points are on it, or the circle, how many how many uh, ve uh, vertices does the circumference may, uh, contain. Um, all of those should be settable, and we need to expose those uh, values to the user. So I'm going to actually keep that bit. But all of uh, this bit... Uh, I think we'll keep quite simple uh, shapes, rectangle shape. Yeah, it was. It just got really complex. So this was creating the uh, rectangle of tiles. Would you believe? Look at that. Uh, to the point where I was actually yes, 
it's needing like sub function. It, it, it was just not the right approach, and I, that's probably one of the reasons it was stalling a little bit. So uh, I think we'll go back and revisit actually how to handle that using the new framework. Uh, so let's get some chats. Well, when will uh, PG three may be released? Uh, it will be released this year. Um, I think it's probably going to be released. It's going to be uh, a soft release because I think to begin with, it will always be released as an extension of PG two. Um, how did you first learn about all of this graphical programming? Uh, for me, it was messing around with, um, well, the plot function in BBC Basic is if you want to go back that far. But I think for real in the reality, when I started to really get into sort of two D graphics and things like that, uh, was messing around with CGA and EGA modes uh, and Turbo C at the time. Uh, so quite some time ago. I find a lot of the, the, the maths for it is, is reasonably intuitive. Have you, if you've had some sort of high school maths education with trigonometry and, and basic geometry, you can actually reason about this stuff quite intuitively. And I just got fascinated by the hacks that people use to actually make things go really quickly. Um, I did some embedded uh, processing of graphics for quite a, a, a substantial part of my academic career. Uh, so when you've got really limited memory and really limited resources, starting to know about how to, to hack your way through, instead of just relying on floating point numbers all the time and trigonometric functions implemented in silicon, they're just not options to you. So you have to start thinking about things a bit differently. Uh, so anyway, what I was saying was that, you know, you saw the rectangle in tiles before was a whole bunch of code, and this is the rectangles in geometry mode. The two could be very, very similar. Uh, so yes, I'm, I'm going to go back and, and revisit that construction in the editor. And I don't think the editor compiles actually at the moment. Although I haven't compiled it for a while. Should we, should we run it for old time's sake, just to remind people what we're actually building here? And um, we'll send that on its merry way. That may take some time. <laughs> yes, it's, it's working through. The, what I, I did actually work out what is the, why are some of the compile times very slow for this project? It's not a it's not a big project. And originally I thought it's because I've got quite a lot of templates in there. Uh, and and yes, that that's true to a reason. But do you know what it actually is? It's sadly Sol. Uh, the the Sol library seems to take quite a lot of time to compile, at least on my old machine here, um, because if specifically, you know, the, these compile times are not they're not super quick either. Uh, if I go and make a change somewhere, put in a, a space of change. There we go, space of change, uh, and build that. You know, they're not the quickest build times ever. Usually it would be click build done. As you can see, they're not. It's still going, still going. And this is a sim simple program, and I think it's the inclusion of the Sol library, because that is actually quite a complicated set of just nothing but templates. Uh, and so there's a lot to resolve there. Compared to the templates I've created in my in my program, there's, there's you know, there's a hundred times more. Right. <clears throat> so quite a few new people there. Thank you very much. I guess Sol does quite, yeah, it does, exactly. Um, it, it is pretty slow. There's probably some tricks I can play with some pre-compiled header stuff um, to, to make that work, although at the moment I can live with it. So has the other one finished compiling it? it if it does, it might have errors. No, it's, it's still going. It's not a big project, but nearly all of these files at some point linked back through to including some Lua to help uh, work in the background. So the WX widget stuff, that compiles pretty quickly. The PG3 stuff, like I said, the templates, they're not deep, right? They're, they're really sort of one level deep of template stuff. Um, not complicated at all. It'd be nice to see if this still runs, actually. I've kind of forgotten what it looks like or what state we left it in. I've been dipping into pinch bits of code because uh, some of the code is actually pretty cool uh, in, in, in how we're doing some of the rendering. But as I've sort of played with this project over the last week, I've begun to realize, um, actually, we, we went about it the wrong way. We went about, with, with all of this, we just went about it the wrong way. So we should si shift all of this, because basically all of this is common stuff that's always going to be there into C++ land, and just focus on outputting the bits that we actually need. Come on, see? This was the problem, right? This would be no good if during a live stream we make a few changes and we have to do this every single time. 
So that's why that's why uh, if for those that haven't been following along, I break it out into uh, little bits and uh, we just compile them independently. Uh, you ever do a project using SDL2? No, um, not really. Uh, I use my own library. Uh, this uh, you've heard me say it, Pixel Game Engine quite a few times. Uh, it covers everything that I need and it's fast, so it's portable. Um, so it, it just what you're seeing rendering now is, I mean that's the whole lot, right? There's there's not much to it. No, I don't want to have to set up graphics hardware or anything like that. I just want to to draw a, a shape or draw some pixels or something. Um, so it works for me. I know the same applies to SFML. Um, I used to do some DirectX programming at some point in my life. That was pretty cool. Ah, good. So it did actually build. That's 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 always reassuring. Um, <clears throat> let's run it. Can we remember? Do we remember all of this? There we go. Uh, do we have a workspace that we've created? Uh, do you want to say this? No. Um, did we have workspaces? Where were the workspaces? E drive. Uh, where am I actually working? Working. Uh, repos. Coder. LC editor. Uh, workspaces. Oh, we did have one. Oh. Right, I've no idea whether which one of these is, is going to crash this or not. We'll, <laughs> we'll have a look. A <laughs> new one, new two, ten, they've all got the same date. So I've no idea. You know, I'm not even going to risk it. We'll just create we'll create something from the start. Uh, see if I can remember how to do this. Uh, so we've got an oh no, there we go. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Try that again. <coughs> uh Right, we've got a new workspace. So we, uh, we, we've added to it uh, an asset pack. We got that? Asset pack. Yeah, okay. Uh, let's add to the asset pack uh, a new resource. Okay, for now we'll just select that because it's there. Okay, and um, oh, we had static tiles, didn't we? So we could do with an asset that was actually a tile asset of some sort, couldn't we? Uh, add new. Uh, let's go back to something around here, Mega Bundle. Oh, yeah, we got these assets and they weren't very good, didn't we? Uh, Nature Platform, that's always a classic. There we go. Um, then what we could then do was create these static data sources. So let's have a look at the static data source, which we assign a, an asset to. Um, in this case, this. Uh, it looks like it's reasonably mapped already, but we could change the number of tiles. Am I right? Yeah. Uh, so we could click those. There's nothing that way because there's nothing to look at. And then this way, down there. So we've got the tiles. We've got the tile size already. And we had construction. So if we go to construction uh, and add to that a new tile layer of static tiles. Uh, and we bring this tab out. Let's just drag you over there for a second. Um, the plan was, I think you could, so hopefully this works, if we pick a paint brush, basic paint, um, and select some tiles here, yep, they appear in there. So that's all working quite nicely. And then we, that was it. We had all sorts of interesting ways of, of selecting the tiles uh, in this space. Um, and then the plan was, well, because we had some, uh, oh yeah, we had like, this was it, so it's option to randomize things, didn't we? So if I actually select those four, uh, you can place those four, but it picks a random one out of those four. Uh, we had flood fills and we also had shape generation, didn't we? So there we go. So if I pick the rectangle, so this is the tile rectangle. Let's just pick a single cell just to make this less confusing. Um, and we can draw a big tile of, of rectangles. It's quite nice. And that's scripted. That was a Lua script uh, going away doing that. Um, we also had circle, didn't we? Uh, oh, let's say we don't want a filled circle. We just want the outline of one. Um, and I've forgotten what these ones did. Nine patch area. Oh, that was fun, wasn't it? Nine patch area. Uh, so if we select a nine patch uh, and then go nine patch area, I think that was it. And then as you start to draw it, yeah, that was it. It it it, it does the whole map. And you can have uh, you could change this, couldn't you, in real time? And it would actually then start to change uh, what things look like. And we created, yeah, it's all coming back to me. But the plan was to then have these things called geometry layers, uh, which is something you may want to sit on top of your tiles. Uh, and I think we had some basic stuff here. 
yeah, there we go. So this was the, the Lewis script creating some geometry, again with these sort of construction nodes, which is sort of passive. It, it, it's how what can you wrap around uh, the data in the background. But at this point, it will crash because uh, it's not programmed properly. <laughs> So, uh, so, so rather than doing this every single time, that's why I like to break it down into what we've seen today, uh, which is just sort of fundamentally the core bit that I want to work on at this point in time, uh, which for me is basic geometry editing in sort of also like a nice, interesting space as well. Um, so, you know, you've got to be careful when everything's sort of snapped and aligned to grid because when you start rotating things, they don't quite go where you think they're going to go um, for a bigger segment. So put you, uh, let's go out here, I think. Was that right? Oh, yeah. So not quite lined up. So the next phase is to be able to select the shapes and actually edit those construction nodes and those individual vertices to give us lots of creative control over what's going on. Uh, so I want to thank all of those new people. Uh, those that don't realize this is the code zone. It only lasts about one hour. Um, and I do one a week. Uh, I'm active on the Discord server. Come and say hello. But until then, take care, everybody. Thank you.